Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, popping back inside at such a nice and sunny day. I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the sun today. Um, this is the second event in a series that is about uh, the uh, sixth assessment report of the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, I hope that is the event you came for. If not, there is the door. <laughs> so in terms of background, um, if you came to the last event that was in uh, October, you have already heard that the IPCC has established that human-induced global warming has reached over one degrees centigrade and is continuing to rise, demonstrating that climate change is not only a threat in the future, but also right now. Uh, the working group two of the IPCC has extensively assessed the widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people uh, that we are seeing as a result. So it's all about basically adaptation to climate change, whereas the first one is on the uh, physical basis of climate change. And the third one uh, that I should highlight as well, there, uh, there will be an um, event next week about the third one, uh, that is about mitigation. So, um, but today about adaptation and vulnerabilities. How are people vulnerable to those changes of climate change? How does this vary? How well, poorly are we adapting to current impacts and how there how are there limits to what we can adapt to? What might be a simultaneously adaptive and mitigative development approach? Um, and how uh, fast is the window closing for taking such approach? So again, I want to welcome you to this event that is jointly hosted by Oxford Climate Research Network and the Oxford Martin School. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of uh, um, academics here that have taken part in the IPCC Working Group 2 and some that will reflect on those. I want to briefly introduce those. Um, um, first, we have Lisa Schipper. She will be joining online and run you through uh, the key findings of Working Group 2. She's from the Environmental Social Science. Uh, she's an Environmental Social Science Research Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute. Then we have um, Nicola Stevens, uh, Trapner, um, do you want to raise your hands? Um, <laughs> there we have. Um, Trapner Fellow for African Environments, uh, also at the Environmental Change Institute. Then we have Dr. Connie McDermott, Jackson Senior Research Fellow and Associate Professor in Land Use and Environmental Change at the Environmental Change Institute, and Amanda Power. Um, uh, Sullivan Clarendon, Associate Professor in History uh, at the Faculty of History. Um, as I said, we start with Lisa, so uh, whenever somebody speaks, I say two <laughs> sentences more, basically. So um, Lisa has led Chapter 18 of the IPCC Working Group 2, uh, and her work is on adaptation development and vulnerability to climate change and nat natural hazards. Um, that will be immediately followed by uh, a couple of more slides um, uh, by Nicola. And um, Nicola has worked in African ecosystems and has a particular interest in grass ecosystems like savannas. Her main research interest is aimed at understanding how Africa's grassy ecosystems are responding to global change across multiple scales. Uh, she has recently participated as well in the IPCC uh, sixth assessment report as a lead author in working group two, working on the ecosystems, uh, deserts and desertification and uh, the Africa chapter. So we'll start with those two and um, I hope you take a good note of it because we come back to uh, um, extensive Q&A at the end. So Lisa, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco, and thank you both to um, to both the organizers for inviting us. And I realize that you cannot see me, but you can see my slides. So I wish I could say that I could see you, but actually I also can only see my slides. But I, I'm very ha happy that you're there, whoever you are in the audience, and hopefully there'll be some questions and the chance to engage later. So I'm going to give a very quick uh, overview, not just of the report, but also just a little bit of a background on IPCC and what it is and why why it is, because I think it's important to, to be aware of this. Um, 
I should say, I have now given probably 20 talks of this uh, report at this point, and I find that it has uh, it has still huge, huge, rich and exciting content um, that I'm really kind of only selecting the things that, that are mostly relevant to me. So obviously I work on adaptation and work on, on human development, and therefore Nicholas coming after me is going to speak uh, about the ecosystems I mentioned. So we've divided it up a little bit that way. So next slide, please. So for those who don't know, I think it's important to recognize that we're now in the sixth assessment cycle of the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it was set up in 1988 because scientists were recognizing that something was happening with the climate. And it was the World uh, Meteorological Organization and the UN Environment Program that, that set it up together. And it was really ca a catalyst for getting the governments around the world to decide that we need to have some kind of policy mechanism to be able to address climate change. So the first assessment report came in 1990. And following year, governments began the negotiations on what eventually is now the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which entered into force in 1994. So this is sort of an interesting, for those who are interested in kind of how science policy processes work, this is really where the science came first and led to the policy being designed. Uh, de de yeah, designed. And in these following years, there is kind of, um, you can see how different reports have led to different uh, policy outcomes. But importantly, the Paris Agreement that sp specifies that countries should say uh, below 1.5 or 2 degrees, actually, there was not any kind of sort of scientific uh, basis for that, that from the IPCC at that point. And so they requested the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to do the special report on 1.5 that came out in 2018. I'm mentioning this report in particular because it is also part of this six assessment report cycle, but also because it has some significant implications for the adaptation findings that we have later. Next slide, please. So the IPCC is not a research body. We, as IPCC authors, donate generously our time, our family's time, everything that we have for more than three years to write these reports. And the purpose is to assess the knowledge, the state of knowledge, to give the governments a sense of what actually do we know about climate change. And in our case, in the working group two, we're looking at impacts, adaptation and vulnerability specifically. So it's really important because you should know we don't get paid, <laughs> we don't, and, and um, we're not doing research. Next slide, please. The other part of the IPCC process that's really critical is this review. It's a very transparent, well, for, for relatively transparent process in the sense that while the report itself is essentially secret to the general public until it's released, there are multiple uh, multiple times during the development of this report that it goes out for peer review. So we have um, expert review, we have then also government review. That means by the time we get to the end, we have a sense as authors of what are the kinds of issues that governments don't really like, and what are the kinds of issues that seem to really, where they're really looking for more information. And the final phase, what we do is we put together a summary for policymakers, and that is the document. It's the shorter document. Uh, that is a document that then gets negotiated with governments over the course of two weeks. So these underlying chapters where Nicola and I were, were part of are not the ones that go for negotiation. Those chapters are already finished by the time we get to that point. Next slide, please. So as I said, it's not research. Um, but the other thing that's really critical is that we're not, we have to stay policy neutral. We can't be policy prescriptive. Um, and we're really trying to get a mix of genders, of disciplines, of nationalities and voices into these reports, um, which is why it's great that Amanda is here today, because maybe she should hopefully reflect a little bit on the different disciplines and, and perspectives. Um, but we also have to somehow balance the, the scientific content with political realities. What are the kinds of things that governments really, really don't like, for instance? What are the kinds of, of, of um, science that they don't like? And of course, there will always be some conflicts of interest, although we, as authors, we say we don't have conflicts of interest, we sign, we sign an agreement that we don't have conflicts of interest. So next slide, please. 
So just briefly, I want to touch on the fact that when we use this phrase IPCC, there are multiple different actors associated with it. So the IPCC can be, uh, it's actually the collection of governments, this intergovernmental panel, right? It's all the governments who, who are part of this. So they're essentially the clients, but it's also the secretariat based in Geneva at the WMO office. It's also sometimes the technical support units that support each of the working groups. Um, it, you can sometimes hear people talk about the IPCC, the chair of the IPCC or the vice chairs. So it, it's, an, it's a little bit confusing. And I think especially you might see it cited in different ways. Sometimes it's cited IPCC 2022, sometimes cited with authors' names. So I think, um, yeah, I just wanted to raise that because I think this can be part of the, the challenge as well. And it's also important to understand that this is not something that scientists are doing kind of independently. We're guided by a very sort of a structure that's given to us, the chapters, the chapter titles, and some bullet points on what the chapters should contain. Next slide, please. And then within the IP, oh, sorry, can you could probably just click through, yeah. So we have multiple different roles as well. We have the coordinating lead authors, the lead authors, we have super important chapter scientists who support our work. We have uh, review editors, and then we have contributing authors who are not nominated by governments, uh, but they're people that we bring in to help support kind of gaps, knowledge gaps. Okay, next please. So here is just a picture of, of course, here we have an IPCC report done in the middle of a pandemic. So most of the meetings were held like this on Zoom, endless hours of Zoom. And to some extent, I think this has impacted the, the report, maybe both in a positive and a negative way. It certainly impacted our lives in a negative way because there's just no end to the amount of Zooms you can have. Um, so I think that's an important dimension as well. Um, all right, next slide, please. So this particular report here, the Working Group 2 report, we had 270 authors from 67 countries of these, we were not 50-50% developing and developed countries, but we're getting better. It's 43% developing country authors, 57% developed country authors, still imbalanced. We're also getting somewhat better on the gender balance, but there's still only 41% women, 59% men. But working group two is much better than the other two working groups. Uh, I think working group one is the worst. I think they're around 27% uh, women and working group three is somewhere in the, the 30. So we, we at least a little bit better, <laughs> but still not great. We looked at, well, we cited more than 34,000 scientific papers. We looked obviously at a lot more because we, there were things we didn't cite in the end. And we received 62,418 review comments over the course of the three years. So that means it has been robustly and thoroughly reviewed. Um, but the key thing, and I didn't point this out, but that big air in the middle of the history of IPCC also shows that the, not, the, the quantity of knowledge now is absolutely unbelievably huge. The number of papers that are available, especially on adaptation, has grown so tremendously. And this has had impacts also on the, the work and the output. I might comment on that later. Okay, next slide, please. So now to get into kind of the essence of this report and the punchline, if you want, is that the scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. We pretty much knew this. Working Group 1, the science basis, has already talked about this. But here comes kind of the, the, the crucial part for Working Group 2. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And those two words are really important, for all. Because it really is, I think this window of opportunity may be bigger if we're talking about for some. But since we're talking, so since the Sustainable Development Goals state very clearly that we are trying to get sustainable development for everybody, for all, that window of opportunity is really, really quickly shrinking. So the report, next slide, please. So the report obviously talks about the impact. It talks about the fact that global warming has caused dangers and widespread disruption in nature. And next slide, please. And that it's affecting, um, that climate change is affecting the lives of billions of people. And this is despite efforts to adapt. So you have to keep in mind, 
we are actually adapting and 170 countries, at least 170 countries already have some kind of adaptation plans, programs um, and projects. But still, despite all this, there are still huge losses and damages. Uh, next slide, please. So part of the reason is, of course, that climate change isn't just coming in on its own. It's not something that's happening in a vacuum. We already have huge development challenges. And for me, especially, I think, obviously, I come from a development background, but I think for me, this report is about development. It's about the way that development, both in the sense that the, the, the development that drives greenhouse gas emissions, but also the development that drives um, inequitable and, and uh, uneven development around the world, how coming together and putting us in this situation. Because we already have people who have limited access to water, sanitation, and health services around the world. We have many people all over the place who are who are who have climate sensitive livelihoods. And of course, for generations and generations, farmers, for instance, have been risk supposed to risk and they know how to manage the risk. But it's now with a combination of that risk and this new risk imposed by climate change that they no longer really know how to how to deal with it. We have high levels of poverty, we have weak leadership, we have a lack of funding. This is a huge issue, lack of funding, not just for development, lack of funding for all sorts of things. Um, lack of funding for research, uh, research on climate change. And then there's a lack of accountability and trust in government. And all of these, these things come together and then with climate change on top of that, it becomes very, very difficult. Next slide, please. So here's the thing that really matters for this report. And this is why I think the Sixth Assessment Report Working Group 2 stands out differently from the previous Working groups, uh, working Group 2 reports. We now know because of the 1.5 report, there's a huge amount of research done that looked at specifically adaptation in the context of temperature. Previously, as an adaptation researcher, we really didn't think about climate the, the temperature increase that much, and particularly didn't think of it as in a relation to maybe creating problems or barriers for being able to adapt. But now we see very, very clearly that not only does every small increase in warming result in increased risk, but it also results in limits to our ability to adapt. Next, please. So as I said, action on adaptation has increased, but the progress is so uneven and we're just not adapting fast enough. Um, so consequently, we now sort of have this position where we understand that adaptation and mitigation must be inherently linked and that in order to be able to adapt, we also have to bring the temp temperature down. Next, please. The challenge is, of course, one about climate justice, that there are increasing gaps between adaptation action taken and what's needed, but these gaps are particularly the largest among the lower income populations. And this is where it's expected to grow, these gaps. Okay, so next slide. There is sort of the, the silver lining to this, if any, is that there we know now what are the options that we can take to reduce the risks to people and nature. We don't know everything, but we know so much that we're really have no reason not to act any longer. Uh, in particular, next slide, please. What we know is that nature offers significant untapped potential. And when we say that is, is because we see that, for instance, agroforestry offers inroads for climate resilient development. And here, this is um, a Nigerian rubber farmer who's diversifying his business with food crops, fruit trees, and bees. So by combining these kinds of efforts, kind of a nexus approach, there's actually um, a higher chance that we avoid maladaptation and other kinds of problems. Next, please. But as I've already alluded to, there are these limits to adaptation and these limits to adaptation are significant. Even effective adaptation is not going to be able to reduce all losses and damages. And what we could know now is that above 1.5, we hit what we call hard limits. That means limits that we can't shift. And some natural solutions will no longer work. Well, may no longer work, but will no longer work. Um, above 1.5, also, there are hard limits in human systems. So a lack of fresh water could mean that people living on small islands and those dependent on glaciers and snowmelts can't adapt any longer because without fresh water, you can no longer live. So 
it's not just in ecosystems or in natural systems, it's also in human systems that we see these hard limits to adaptation. We also have soft limits to adaptation, and these include things like lack of education or, for instance, needing to be retrained in new kinds of livelihoods. Um, funding is a soft limit because we can actually add funding, but we're not doing it at the moment, um, and these kinds of things. And so, but there's a huge amount of limits. But this temperature limit is really critical because by two degrees, it'll be really challenging to farm multiple staple crops in many uh, of the areas that they're currently growing. So I think what we're seeing is we're really being boxed in. The adaptation options are really being squished together as a result of the increase in, in warming. Uh, and I think, you know, if anybody ever comes and says, well, let's just, you know, if it's too late, we can't adapt. It's, I mean, sorry, we can't mitigate. It's too difficult to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Well, we're also not going to be able to adapt our way out of it then. So that's a really critical message. Next, please. One of the things I've already mentioned is at maladaptation. And since the fifth assessment report, we've had a huge amount of analysis done on the growing number of adaptation projects that have been implemented around the world. And unfortunately, what we see, the evidence that emerges from this shows very clearly that many adaptation projects they're not just resulting in unintended consequences, they're actually making people more vulnerable to climate change. And this is a huge problem. This is something that we really need to worry about. And this is, um, the photo on the left is, is showing that engineering and kind of systems, engineering approaches to adaptation have a, a, a higher risk of locking people into a, uh, a pathway that isn't actually going to help them adapt or actually make them, may make them more vulnerable. On the right is showing a kind of an ecosystem-based type of approach to adaptation to, to flood management. Uh, one of the key issues is that, of course, the disadvantaged people are the most likely to be affected by maladaptation. Now, that's usually because they are marginalized and they don't get a say in planning adaptation projects. And research has shown that those are the kinds of things that lead to maladaptation. Uh, OK, next slide. So. What the, what the report shows is that to avoid these mounting losses, urgent action is required. And at the same time, it's essential to make rapid, deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions to keep the maximum number of adaptation options open. I just want to emphasize that one of the things that we know about maladaptation is that we be need better planning to avoid maladaptation. Better planning means more consultations, more careful discussions, a better understanding of the kind of the context of vulnerability. That, of course, will take time. We also have on the other side saying, pressure, pressure, we need to act urgently. So this is a huge conundrum and we really need to figure out how to, how to address this. So my final slide is the next one, which is about the need to accelerate adaptation. So, sorry, um, could you please click? <laughs> oh, thanks. So, yeah, so obviously political commitment and follow through across all levels of government is fundamental because even though there are multiple different actors who need to act, governments absolutely have to lead the way. Institutional frameworks need to have clear goals. They need to have priorities that define responsibilities and responsibility in some ways is kind of the elephant in the room. That's where we really need to look. Who is going to do all of these things? We need to enhance knowledge of impacts and risks to be able to improve responses. And this is, again, understanding exactly who's being affected, being careful, understanding the vulnerability context. We also need much better monitoring and evaluation of adaptation measures, and I should say learning processes that help us understand what exactly is going on, what goes wrong, so that we can feed that learning back into the next time we design projects. And then finally, we need much more inclusive governance that prioritizes equity and justice and direct participation, not just representative uh, or, or performative participation. All of these things, and I haven't actually put in here anything about the, my chapter, but all of these things are kind of enablers for this climate resilient development, which in a way is what we see as a kind of the, the way forward, combining mitigation uh, of greenhouse gas emissions with adaptation to climate change to support sustainable development, not doing any of those things in a silo and really thinking them through strategically. So that gives you the really snapshot overview of kind of the core issues. And then Nikki's going to take it away with the ecosystems uh, stuff.
in my voice. So if you can't hear me, stick up a hand and I'll try again. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about the ecosystem impacts and I'm going to give a little bit, I'm going to dive in a little bit more deeper about some of the ecosystem impacts because um, they're really fascinating and really interesting. Um, so the first thing I wanted to make the point is that many people are going to be affected directly by climate change and the estimate is 3.3 to 3.6 billion people are going to live in a climate change hotspot. Um, that means they're really vulnerable to climate change. Um, and that means that these people are directly going to be impacted by climate change through risk um, direct impact or food, in, food insecurity. But there's an additional component that we really need to think about is how the ecosystems are going to be changing because ecosystems are nat nature's ecosystems are provide crucial ecosystem services, which become increasingly important in the warming world. And these are just some of the examples of ecosystem services that nature provides through pollination or coastal protection or water, water, water filtration. And often the people who are most, most at risk um, rely on these ecosystem services as an important buffer for poverty. Um, so it's really important to understand how these things are going to be changing into the future. Um, so this so the, I'm presenting some of the key results from the ecosystems chapter. And the first result that I'm talking about is how, how much um, animal and plant ranges have changed and a, a timing of like biological events, the phenology has changed and physiology has changed. And we actually understand this from previous reports. We knew and we continue to know that changing plant and animal ranges and physiology and phenology is occurring. Um, what is new in this report is that we know now that strong trends have been observed on every continent. Since the last report, now up to 12,000 species have been assessed um, and that they show changes in their distribution or phenology that are consistent with climate change. Um, importantly, of those 12,000, 4,000 species have been assessed whether these changes are actually driven by climate change. And when they've been assessed, the answer is that climate change, particularly increases in the frequency and severity of extreme events, have driven change. And this fundamental shift in species ranges is beginning to alter communities. But again, this is something that we've known from previous reports. Um, this report continues to confirm this um, without a doubt. I thought this would be an interesting and sad um, segue, but there have been three climate change related extinction events or near extinction events that have been that have been documented. Um, there's the one of the cloud um, forest golden toad. It went extinct after successive extreme droughts. Um, there's an example of the subspecies of this ringtail possum, which disappeared after heat waves in 2005. An extensive census is, um, for in 2009 only found two individuals, so it's near extinct. Um, and the Bramble K mosaic tailed rat was actually the first species that they have um, officially declared as um, a climate change related extinction, where it lived in a little island near the Great Barrier Reef, and these climate change induced storm surges have um, essentially removed the population. There's also this consistent pressure of climate change in the chytrid fungus, which is really pushing the many reptile species um, to the edge. In general, climate hazards outside um, the range in which species are adapted um, is occurring on all continents and continues to be a severe threat. So all of this means that biodiversity loss is a significant problem. And the projections are that at 1.5, we're going to have significant biodiversity loss. And if we let warming to continue unabated, it's going to be very severe. But and there's and talk of individual species and the biodiversity impacts have been fairly well assessed and are frequently discussed. And we do understand very clearly that biodiversity loss is an imminent threat. Um, something that we really also need to think about, which compounds biodiversity loss and biodiversity threats, is how ecosystems themselves are fundamentally being impacted. And this has this is always this is also a topic that's always been in all the reports, but I feel like this AR6 really highlights just how extreme this, uh, these changes have been. Um, ecosystems are changing in their structure, function, and distribution. Um, and this is a map where we've plotted all observed changes in the distribution of plant functional types. So that means that you see more trees in grassy systems, or you see more grasses in deserts, for example. And these have all been, um, they're all 
present if there has been some link to climate change or some climate related change. And the general idea is that the biomes seem to be reorganizing themselves in a way, but you're getting this fundamental shift in the structure of biomes and that you're getting a lot of rainforest is expanding into grassy ecosystems. Grassy ecosystems, tropical and temperate are becoming much more woody. So this is not nature healing itself, just by the way. Um, but these grassy ecosystems are being lost um, due to the increased woody cover across um, many of these areas. We're also getting things like grasses moving into desert margins. Uh, many of them are invasive grasses, which means that you get fires, you're getting these novel fire regimes in areas that never burnt before. Anyway, so you are just getting this complete restructuring of our, of our ecosystems, which is actually, this obviously has a fundamental impact on the biodiversity, which we haven't even begun to link. Um, I thought I would also just give you a quick run round of what some of the major biome impacts are. I've summarized this grossly, so I'm probably not doing it in good justice. But in summary, the tundras have been, the, the assessment from AR6, this is sort of their recent assessment. Some of this was already found in AR5, but what the AR6 concludes is that there is definitely earlier snowmelt and permafrost thawing, and this is changing the hydrology and nutrient cycling of systems in the tundra. Boreal forest, without a doubt, is expanding into the tundra, and woody shrubs are encroaching within the tundra, and there's a large increase in number of fires. The Mediterranean, sorry, I didn't put them nat naturally ma matching biomes, but anyway, Mediterranean type ecosystems like the um, chaparral and fanbos um, are experiencing increased drought dramatically, and there's increased fire activity. These are often the sites where you see these mega fires, which are having severe impact and loss of life. They're often in the Mediterranean type ecosystems. There are climate change linked declines in biodiversity. This is interacting with climate change and fire. And um, there's increased tree mortality in these systems. And these are essentially non-grassy systems. And you're noticing an increase in grass dominance in these areas. Um, boreal forests. Um, one of the major findings is that there is significant expansion of the boreal forest into the tundra biome. There's also very high tree mortality associated with drought, increased fire and beetle infestations. <clears throat> the tropical forests, um, the tropical forests are showing expansion into savannas across all biomes. So Africa, Asia and um, South America, there's clear expansion of forests into savannas. Um, you are noticing there's some forest biomass increase, but the biomass increase is slowing. There's also been a shift in species composition towards arid adapted, more arid adapted species. Um, and the trees have shorter resident, residence times, basically they live less long. Um, and there's this climate change associated degradation with warming and increased fire and drought, which is also feeding back to these, uh, these areas. Temperate forests are very much like the boreal forests, except there's this tendency for a shift towards deciduous species. This is the one impact that is we seeming to be observing. It hasn't been, I wouldn't say it's one of our low confidence statements, but there just, it does seem to be the shift towards more deciduous species at the expense of evergreen species. There's high mortality linked to drought, increased fire and pest outbreaks, much like the boreal systems and many forests. Um, Grasslands and savannas, um, I'm referring to tropical and temperate grasslands here, there is widespread greening, um, which is often associated with increased leaf area, and there's extensive woody encroachment and associated loss of ecosystem function and biodiversity of grass-loving, light-loving species. There's expansion of trees into grasslands, and there's this trend which we're also beginning to understand is changing grass productivity. Um, and deserts and shrublands, again, there's also this in increased greening, which is driven by increased leaf area um, and woody cover, and also in some cases, increased grass biomass or productivity at the interface of deserts. Um, in many countries, in North America, this has been um, shown very clearly that there's increased alien, alien grass invasion, um, and the spread of grasses into these systems also results in novel fire regimes. So also there are quite a few biodiversity hotspots which suddenly are being burnt, which never were burnt. Um, I think of some of the succulent Karoo in South, Southern Africa. Um, so it, all of these are comprehensively explained in the ecosystems chapter. So if you want to know more about it, I really haven't done it justice, but these are 
not only are we experiencing these biodiversity impacts, but we are experiencing significant changes in this ecosystem structure and function. And this is just, um, just really compounds the ecosystem, the impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services that we're experiencing in these areas. Um, this is a summary. Also, this is one of the um, burning ember diagrams from the chapter two, which highlights key risks to terrestrial and um, freshwater ecosystems. And biodiversity loss is a key risk that has been observed. Um, structural change is something that's been observed and it's probably the most extreme because we're already seeing extensive structural change. And we're not relying on projections anymore, we're just relying on observations. Extensive tree mortality, particularly in forests, and that map that I showed you previously highlights it quite clearly, there's a lot of tree mortality in forests. Um, there's an increase in wildfire, not everywhere, but in some places you've got this increase in fire intensity and you're getting a shift from towards more intensive crown fires, which are having significant ecosystem impacts and loss of livelihoods and losses and damages. And there's also this tendency towards loss, carbon loss, so permafrost melting, um, your tropical rainforests having short residence time. So there's this tendency for our net, uh, carbon sink to be eroding over time. So the, the one other interesting message, which also brings into question, what do we do next? Is we've been very successful at projecting ecosystem changes. Um, but if we look at the projections from the third assessment report, actually the pro ecosystem projections that we made there, we, that the authors made then were pretty good. Um, the trends were quite good. There was, they got some things wrong, but some of the general trends were pretty good. But from AR4 and AR5, the projections of ecosystem changes and impacts were good. They got the correct direction and they got a reasonable match with the sort of the strength of changes that have been projected. Um, and some of the, vari the more variable projections come from the ecosystems that tend to be less studied. And one of them was the Mediterranean ecosystems and the grassy ecosystems, particularly the grass and biome, have been not as well assessed or and the projections are not so good. But the point is we actually, we knew several cycles ago what the ecosystem impacts were. And now we've been far along now that we're actually measuring the ecosystem impacts. And what we can say is that we actually have a fairly good confidence in what projections are into the future. So we know what they are. We really should be doing something about it. We, sh we shouldn't be surprised. Um, there's still some unknowns about how about how these changing biodiversity, how changing biodiversity and changing ecosystems feed back to um, the Earth's system. But for the most part, we understand what some of these changes are going to be. So we can't say we don't know. Um, and the next, so we're given that. Um, the next point is there are some options that we can do to risks to reduce the risks to people and nature. And because I'm talking about ecosystems, there is of course there. Are, there are options to do um, adaptation for ecosystems to reduce the climate change impact um, on ecosystems. And this often involves um, sort of clicks type kinds of actions, which means you increase the protected areas, you increase um, assisted adaptation, assisted migration. And then there's the idea that you increase protected areas and connectivity. And then some people suggest 30 to 50% of the earth protected is a viable option. I think that's quite controversial and something worth discussing also. Um, but certainly we need to enhance our ability for our ecosystems to adapt because certainly our role, the ecosystems have a really important role in helping adapt, mitigate and benefit people under climate change. This is sort of forms falls under this ecosystem based adaptation or this falls under the framework of nature based solutions. And through conservation, protection and restoration of ecosystems, we can enhance the adaptive capacity of ecosystems. We can also enhance mitigation potential, um, but we have to manage ecosystems themselves to adapt to climate change. Of course, this is only possible if we've got financing to do this. Um, and this allows us, um, yeah, well, the other thing is, if we're going to go this route, what we do need to do is actually improve on our ability to quantify nature's contribution to adaptation. And we talk about it glibly and we say that th this is a huge possibility, but we actually need to quantify it a little bit more, which I think is a uh, gap. Um, but of course there are limits. And I think this is also something very important. We tend to speak, now we've summarized the IPCC report quite broadly and we've given you a global picture, but it's really important to note that not all ecosystems are the same. Some have really nice um, mechanisms to respond um, to climate change. You can manage with manipulating fire and herbivory, for example. 
um, where you have other systems that are sitting at their climate edge where you don't have as many options to manage for these changes. But it's important to know that not all of these systems respond the same and local, local knowledge is key. And in the rush to do things in response to the climate emergency, there are unintended side effects. Lisa spoke about maladaptation for people, but some of these maladaptation um, things work in nature, and especially with the emphasis on using nature for mitigation, there is this risk that we are damaging many of our ecosystems um, to focus only on carbon rather than biodiversity and the adaptation potential. Um, and again, adaptation and mitigation capacity changes with warming. So as Lise mentioned, there are limits to this. Um, and again, the increasing extreme events and significant losses cannot be avoided. And nature has a role, but it's not, it's not foolproof. And again, nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation and using nature as this potential is really important. But it's also important that nature shouldn't be used as a distraction from the important business of cutting emissions. And I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, next up, we have uh, reactions uh, to basically the latest findings from the IPCC report. Uh, first by Amanda Power. Amanda Power is a Sullivan Clarendon Associate Professor in Medieval History and the Oxford Faculty of History. She has been involved in developing new approaches to historical study that speak to the concerns of climate and environmental crises. In particular, she focuses on the work that humanity, uh, humanities discipl disciplines uh, can do to help bring about and support societal transformations. She is currently working on a monograph called Medieval Histories of the Anthropocene. She co-convenes the Climate Crisis Thinking in the Humanities and Social Sciences Network based in Torch and the Oxford Martin School. Amanda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Probably you're wondering what a medieval historian is doing here. Um, but I, I think that a humanities perspective is really essential and is one of the things that is not entirely, but quite often missing from IPCC type approaches to these problems. And although climate scientists have gone to a lot of trouble to demonstrate that climate change is anthropogenic in its causes, the anthropogenic tends to just get left there. So why is it that humans are doing this why don't we stop when we know we're doing it? What are the human things that keep driving this and how can we address them? Because I think if we don't know amount of tech-based solutions or the kind of research that is gathered in the IPC is actually going to get enough traction fast enough. Um, so I want to just pick up a couple of things from, um, from what we've just heard. So I suppose particularly the notion that every increase in warming will result in increased risks. Um, and I think these risks are social and political too. And I think in a sense, they may be predominantly that because I think if I mean, we're already seeing the decay of what we would have regarded a couple of decades ago as rational political discourse and what's acceptable for political leaders to do and say, um, we're seeing a media that is increasingly uninterested on the whole in informing people about this and is very much invested in all sorts of disinformation. We're seeing wars that are already disrupting um, good strategy and opening up the gate, the, the doors to in, increase fossil fuel use rather than kind of managed um, divestment. Um, we're seeing already wars that are affecting food supplies and this is probably just the beginning. So I think what we can assume is that the more this goes on, the less capacity there's going to be to deal with it, there's le the less money, there's going to be the less political will. And I think we've already seen that, that governments are not interested in dealing with this at the at the scale um, and speed that are needed. And I think we know who, you know, who, who governments are working for. And I don't think in general it's it's the people or, or not not the people fast enough. Um, and and so a lot of this is why the why why, why is the situation possible? Why, why, why do people accept this situation? Um, what are the, the narratives that hold in place the systems of values that keep driving us in, in one direction and not in other directions? Um, and, and what happens as um, the problems mount up in, in social terms and 
the solutions to them become solutions that we've seen in World War II and other, other situations where if you don't have enough resources for the population, you reduce the population. Um, so that we've got, I, I, I don't want to be unduly grim, but I think we probably need to be. And I think if we look at the history of humanity and how it deals with pressure of various kinds, we can see all sorts of um, inspiring stories of resilience, but we can also see some pretty sobering stories of, of, of a kind of reality that exists outside the, the kind of language of, of policy and science. And I think this is where um, humanities disciplines are really important for, for getting at the kind of the grit and the grain of, of this. Um, so I, I think that uh, with that in mind, what's really necessary is to bring, I, th I think this, because there's been a sense of urgency ever since these problems became um, widely discussed in the public sphere. And I think when you want to do things urgently, you bring in science and technology, you don't bring in historians and literary people and musicians and anyone else who might um, be seen as not quite of the real world or taking too long or perhaps unpicking concepts that we don't have time to unpick. And I think that that, that, that absence of, of these perspectives or, or not total absence, but considerable absence of these perspectives has been really damaging to bringing along the rest of society and even and keeping it in, informed and giving it sort of traction for imagination of, of better things. So people can see wind farms and kind of get excited if they're that way inclined. But in a sense, there's not very much to invest in imaginatively there. And there are a lot of things that people, I think, don't realise they're setting against it. And I just want to give you some very, very quick um, illustrations of this. So what some of you may have seen these, these are frescoes um, from ancient Assyria that are in the British Museum, and they depict the King of Kings, um, who this is his this is his propaganda about himself. So he can kill a lion with his bare hands. Um, he's got um, slaves um, logging the cedars of Lebanon, which are big, beautiful, famous trees, bringing them to build his palace. Um, and at the bottom, huge numbers of enslaved workers who are, are doing this this work, and. This is how power is displayed. This isn't a uh, mayor culpa. He's not sorry. He did this. This is this is how he shows that he's the guy in charge. And I think these values have absolutely infused our sense of what makes for civilization, what makes for good governance, what makes for what humans are supposed to be doing on this planet. And I think until we can start disentangling these values and recognizing just how far rooted they are in and our whole sense of how humans ought to be, we're really stuck with them. Um, and lest anyone doubts the, the power of ideas, just one quick medieval example. So when um, people were being, as, as particular kinds of power expanded in Europe during um, the, the post-Roman period, one of the one of the recurring metaphors was that the Christian missionaries would come in. All the pagan people were deeply involved in their local ecosystems. They worship springs, they worship rocks, they worship trees. Their identity was connected with their local environments and the kind of protection and maintenance of local environments and the kind of essence of life in those in those ecosystems. The Christian missionaries would come in, they cut down the trees. This would break the tie between the local population and its environment, and people would turn to Christianity. They'd start focusing their attention on salvation and um, on on the centralizing church, and the meaning of human life became to go to heaven, which of course lies outside the planet and, and not in, in investment in human life and human futures. And again, this isn't people saying, I'm sorry for cutting down the tree and destroying your relationships with it. This is this is boasting. Um, this is the great triumph. This is the thing that built Europe. Um, and, and Boniface there is um, often considered the father of Europe amongst early medievalists because he did these things. Um, and the kind of rationality of cutting down trees for development persists, the HS2 being um, one example. Um, and then just finding to show how these ideas connect very brutally with reality. So these are stories about saints that I've been illustrating. But what we have here is um, the idea that every time you set up a monastery, the monks go into the wilderness, they cut down the trees and they make the land productive um, and they bring in settlers and, um, and the, the forests are cleared, the marshes are drained and you have productive um, landscapes that are producing surpluses to support elite lifestyles. Um, so you move from from the first one to the second one, which I think is quite bleak, even though this is meant to be a beautiful picture of an ord ordered landscape. Um, really interesting. Um, I mean, you could, there are endless pieces of research that show this, but this is just the one I've picked. So this is um, of a forest in Poland where um, a religious order moved in and did exactly that. And you can see, this is a peak core sample. You can see the rapid transformation of the type of forest um, within a space of just a few years. So what they said they were doing, they were in fact doing. And this this was um, forest that had been um, 
this is pollen mostly, um, pretty stable for a very long time before this happened. And then suddenly it's, it's erratic, it's an anthropogenic environment in a way it hadn't been before. So I, I, the point of this is really just to show how, um, how central how you think is to what happens to environments. And I, I mean, I guess we know this, but I think that these sorts of things, if you put them in the form of stories and histories, I think this is how we begin to get people to change. And this does take time, but I think the more we don't do it, the more we're left with just trying to communicate through scientific data, which doesn't, we know it doesn't communicate, it hasn't been communicating. So I think if we have, um, I think a lot of what needs to be done needs to be substituted with, uh, sorry, it needs to be um, supplemented with, with um, really important cultural interventions. And this can't just be the translation of scientific findings into accessible terms by humanities people who know how to do that. It's got to be a, a, a really thorough overhaul of, of kind of a, a profound sense of how humans work and, and how they should be operating in landscapes and telling the histories differently, um, particularly progress narratives. So I think most people assume that, that that human advance is over time is progress and that, that there's a kind of general direction of travel and that looks like development. Development is the, the word for this thing that we've been doing to the environment that's resulted in the Anthropocene, that's resulted in climate change, that's re resulted in um, disasters to biodiversity. We need to question these terms quite powerfully um, and, and unpick that th those, those ways of thinking. Um, and I think this can be done um, in ways that that can capture people's imagination by telling the human past differently, by looking at what's been left out, by unpicking question, ideas like civilization and looking again at the things that we considered barbarous um, or primitive or, or indigenous or all these sort of categories that um, that show that there are alternatives. And I think a lot of what's happened is that people have got stuck in thinking that humans are supposed to be going in a particular direction and it's control of nature that marks out that direction. So pulling back from that and reimagining and reinventing through literature and histories, um, I think is an important part of, um, of, of inducing what, what Tim Lenton's talked about as human tipping points as a, as a really quite crucial part of this bigger picture. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, last but not least, we have Connie, Mac, uh, Connie McDermott, who leads the Land Use and Sustainability Governance Program at uh, Oxford's Environmental Change Institute. Her research examines dynamics of power and equity in the governance of forest, land use and supply chains. She recently served uh, again as a coordinating lead author for an uh, expert panel report by the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. Uh, under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. Colleen, uh -huh. up to you. Thank you, everyone, to Marco and this panel so far for doing a really excellent job of outlining the contribution of this report to our understanding about climate change and also possible pathways to resilience. And thanks also to Amanda for pointing out the importance of humanities in addressing these challenges. In fact, there's now a wealth of scientific knowledge about the nature and severity of climate change threats and the need for action. I think a lot of people are very convinced of the need for action. And to draw on the words uh, of the report itself, a need for deliberate transformations. What is less clear and more contested is how we should transform society and who should decide. There are fundamental questions of governance and politics, as I think has come up. This is, this is a political question. So I'd like to highlight two key points of contention around how to achieve climate resilient development. And I wanna be somewhat provocative. The first is around the relationship between social and ecological resilience. And the second is the role of finance. And this is in part in response to the report and some of the things we've heard today. So I wanna draw, the reason I had Marco mentioned about that Red Plus report is that I wanna draw on the example of reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation or Red Plus as a key mechanism for climate mitigation under the UNFCCC. So we just completed this report looking at progress over the last you know, 12 years or so in Red Plus. So this is based on, on also some thorough review of, of what we know about it. So it has become the norm to legitimate efforts to stop deforestation 
uh, by arguing that forests play a very important role in the livelihoods of local communities and indigenous people. I don't think there's a, necessarily a lot of debate about that, that forests can play a very important role. I think where there is more debate is whether deforestation has necessarily been bad for communities or whether stopping it is going to necessarily help communities. I think that's where we have to be a bit careful about um, how we understand these relationships. Another very widespread claim is that the chief barrier to stopping deforestation is finance, that we don't have enough finance sort of counter all the pressures, the financial pressures to convert forests to oilseed crops and develop near the frontier. So again, I'm not sure that so many people would debate that there is a problem with finance and that there's a problem of the balance of finance for deforestation versus forest conservation. But I think not all might agree that a quick acceleration of billions of dollars in finance for red plus or adaptation or hundreds of billions will necessarily result in win-wins for biodiversity and people. So I think the case of red plus provides some really good evidence to test these sorts of claims. You know, what are the synergies where, you know, or what are the tensions in how we think through this problem and the solutions? So red plus is very heavily focused on payments for results on finance, on paying countries for um, reducing, measurably reducing their emissions from forest loss. The way that Red Plus addresses the linkage between ecological and social values is through this idea of safeguards. So that Red Plus actions must demonstrate that they are safeguarding other values besides carbon. Uh, but actually the results-based payments under Red Plus are for forest carbon. So under the UNFCCC Green Climate Fund, for example, countries have already been receiving red plus results-based payments now. There's something like 17 countries that have been reporting, gotten to the results-based phase of red plus, reporting to UNFCCC, and we started to see payments for results. How are safeguards being addressed? Well, um, these countries must report that they've addressed their safeguards. There is no assessment of the performance of the safeguards. There hasn't been thus far. So the money basically goes for carbon. Yet there is a wide and growing body of evidence that for interventions to stop deforestation to be likely to protect biodiversity and local communities, these values have to be sort of hardwired, these objectives have to be hardwired into these efforts. And there has to be strong ownership and ongoing engagement of local actors, well really of actors in multiple scales. When this haven't, hasn't happened, then this has undermined efforts to slow deforestation and uh, at the same time tended to reinforce inexisting inequalities in the distribution of, for of power and profits from forest and land management. It's tended to reinforce these inequalities in part because so often local communities um, on forest frontiers um, lack legal rights and, and, and protections for the, to, to protect their rights. So fortunately though, there is a wide range of actions that can be taken that do not require large sums of international finance. There are plenty of examples of indigenous and local communities managing forests and maintaining them in good condition. And there's examples of national and local governments taking positive action or even responsible companies, um, all without the need for carbon payments. So the question is, how can we create this sense of shared ownership and problem solving as kind of a central question? How can we, rather than thinking you either have to pay people or, you know, or um, I guess take punitive action, how can we actually create a sense of shared ownership? Well, one way, the simpler way, is to talk about how we might support the existing initiatives that seem to be working at multiple scales, but especially locally driven initiatives and make sure that um, larger efforts like Red Plus are not get, actually getting in the way of all the things that people do already to conserve and steward our resources, if not indigenous people very importantly, but many, many other communities as well. Um, but also, in another more challenging task that actually this IPCC report we're talking about calls for is to transform our governance and financial systems to better distribute power, profits, and capacities for climate resilient development. And arguably, until we can do that, until we can actually transform our systems, can we really expect any sort of radical transformation of the situation we're facing um, today that's so well covered in this report? Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
everybody. We now move to the Q&A phase since, uh, um, uh, to give you time to ask your questions. Please, all panelists, come up here. Uh, we received a few questions online as well. Um, and maybe i briefly start with those. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so um, Ian Cable asks, as we struggle to adapt to increasingly inhospitable climate extremes, how likely do you think it is that we use solar radiation management technologies, such as sulfate aerosol injection, to buy us time and cool the earth as we continue to cut emissions? Who would like to address this? Uh, Marco, I, I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> Yeah, we can see you now. Uh, please oh, go ahead okay. to re react to the question. Well, I did put a bit of a response already in the the um, web thing, but I think the, the critical thing with these kinds of technologies is that maybe they would work. But I think the key thing is what I want to underscore is that what we're talking about here is not that you know, everything is fine, then climate change comes on top of it and we only need to address climate change. No, actually, we really need a new development paradigm. We're not moving in the right direction because not only is development causing the greenhouse gas emissions that we're fighting, but it's also the cause of the vulnerability to climate change. I mean, it's the development processes, the resource extraction, the colonialism, and all these things that are actually making people vulnerable to climate change. So we're, we're creating the problem ourselves, but then we're adding to it and I think that if we, when we suggest that these kinds of these kinds of approaches, these te technological approaches, are the solution, what I worry about is that we then park the idea of actually trying to transform our development paradigm, and then we still have these same issues. That we're still going to have all these people who remain, or even are going towards um, more difficult lives, and and where, whose well-being is certainly not something that that um, at the level that we want to see. So I think this is what my contribution to this, because I, I fear very much about these these approaches for that reason. Um, not then there's all the kind of potentially adverse consequences of them, but it's really that sort of you know the mindset, the shift. Uh, I think as as Connie was talking about, as as um, Amanda was also talking about, like how do we we need to rethink what we're doing as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that came out nicely in, in the contributions er, earlier as well. Is, is there maybe something you would like to add in terms of what kind of sort of uh, change in mindset, what, what practical change in mindset would actually be needed? You mentioned financial markets, you mentioned the role of religion before that um, was implicated basically in, in negative changes. But how can a new sort of uh, narrative look like that would actually contribute to uh, moving somewhere else? I think in a sort of fundamental sense, it seems that there's so much emphasis on people at a, at a sort of international far removed level, whether it's Oxford University or whether it's, you know, sitting in Bonn or New York or wherever you are thinking, oh, OK, you know, how are we going to solve this problem? People out there are doing the wrong thing. How can we get them to do something different, whether it's paying them or having more regulations or in, import bans and, you know, and things like this? for deforestation risk commodities. And actually, I mean, I think the hopeful thing is there is so much, you know, grassroots activity or different kinds of networked activities um, trying to address climate change, so much momentum from the people, and it's not being given serious enough attention or even really being studied very well. I had one student I worked with who looked at this interfaith climate environment network, um, which was very hard to study because it was a network. It wasn't UNFCCC, which everybody gets rewarded for looking at. And it was actually very hard for her to, to, do, to do her study on, on this topic. And people weren't as interested as you think they would be, but actually this is a fascinating network that involves all these different you know, sort of NGOs and nonprofits in different places in Asia and Africa and some uh, in the Americas as well, you know, sort of horizontally learning from different things they were trying out. So I think there's just a lot of good things going on. And I think we as a research community too, need to just open our minds a bit more about this maybe the humanities can help too, and not just think that it's these, these, I think these formal processes are important. I mean, I think I'm not sort of a, oh, let's get rid of the United Nations necessarily. I don't know. I'm not going to weigh in on that. They're important dialogues, but they're not necessarily going to get us where we need to go with that. We, you know, we just need so much more than that to open that solution space a lot broader. I'm going to switch 
was it also the same for you to do what I was saying and I mean it's still something to, to figure out a bit because it's 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 been removed so much from public discourse but obviously education is a really major thing and especially if we're looking in the coming decades this isn't you know it's not going away it's it's something that um people currently at school now who, who, who are still there to be educated um in in ways that are better and more helpful um and and there are a lot of initiatives already in, in you know international ones and and within national education systems and, and, and more sort of smaller and specific than that to try and build um, ideas about sustainability, better critical thinking, better sort of skills around what sorts of professions you might go into that would be environmentally useful in all sorts of different ways. That That's working its way into education systems in different ways. And obviously that's got to be quite locally appropriate. Um, in in um, more affluent countries, it probably does need to be at the level of how how we understand progress, what we're demanding from the rest of the world in terms of, of how we live and, and the services that we require everyone else to offer in terms of providing the sort of lifestyles that that, that, that people in wealthy countries want. But I think um, I've been talking to a lot of um, teachers who are teach, trying to teach history, they need the resources. And, and I think that's a major thing for the academic community to be producing. Like, even if um, government education policy isn't hospitable which it often isn't or is very selective about where they want you to talk about these sorts of things there's a lot that people can do in the classroom if they want to and and i think i get the sense that people feel underqualified to do it and desperate to to be given the help to be able to do that and the students are desperate to learn it in many cases um so i mean that's a, that that touches the whole population if you can get that going and and i think that the, there's so much work already in place that it, may not be very long before education is a major route um and i mean maybe i could probably go on but perhaps i shouldn't mm -hmm. um this is great Rita, would, would you like to react on sort of how to bring local knowledge uh, to the to the fore I, I don't know to say, but I, was really I wanted to ask you a question um in terms of like storytelling like so like if you grow up in sort of western society you get told fairy tales and fairy tales have this idea of woods and grasslands and what, what do you sort of see that as a place to start spreading this sense of narrative and connection with nature and or you know is that something that's been studied and looked at well i think there's a lot of i, I don't know it's been quantified it probably has been but I mean, there's a huge amount of nature writing and 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 if you're going to Blackwells now, the place is absolutely coming down with books about ecosystems and trees and fungi and um, indigenous wisdom. And there's a there's a huge appetite for this. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say how widespread it was across society, but I think it's you can see traces of it, you know, sort of all over the place. And if you look at green local politics and community groups, these are points of reference for an awful lot of people. Um, and I think that the cl uh, climate fiction of various kinds, dystopian, um, fiction films the don't look up film that probably everyone's aware of on netflix is you know that's got different conversations starting there are a lot, lot of a lot of places where um there's a sort of appetite for it and so, so i think what we need is both um the cautionary dystopian stuff but i think what people really need is is more positive stories that that show you how to imagine yourself back into well into, into ecosystems partly but also um into into different possibilities for living. And I think that, that that's that's a very rich source of material and it's being generated hugely at the moment. Um. Let's take some questions. Okay, uh, I think this was, the hand over there was first. Do we have the mic? Uh, over there. Who would like to address this one? That's a, that's a really tricky question because, uh, yeah, I was involved actually in another report that was looking at um, SDG uh, 16 and the, the rule of law and, and the role of governance and everything in, in addressing sustainable development. And I think we have to be really careful in how we approach that because I think the idea of the legal system being helpful in protecting rights is, is, a, is an ideal that 
societies may aspire to, but it's not necessarily how it works everywhere. And so in the context of forests and forest governance, there's been a major trend to sort of equate the issue of deforestation with illegality. And this has had some very, sometimes very perverse effects because in many developing countries, you know, communities lack rights to forest resources. Um, so they can't legally access resources. So in the case of Ghana is a great example where, you know, a native tree that a farmer has left to grow, allowed to grow on their own farm, they have no rights to, but the government can legally come in, you know, and have a, you know, a forest or timber company come and cut that tree and take it away and sell it to the EU because it's legal. So, so I think this focus on legality as a way of trying to, you know, strengthen rights in developing or anywhere is, can, can be a tricky one because it's sort of relying on the system itself to protect people's rights. So I think um, we also have to think more broadly about, about governance and other forms of governance and recognized traditional and customary systems, et cetera, in thinking about, about rights and law. So, I mean, I, I, I think that's kind of getting at your question. I think, yes, it's a very important issue to think about rights, but we also be really careful about how we frame it. And some of the current framings are, are dangerous. <laughs> in terms of what they might do unintentionally or otherwise. Okay, let's um, get back to questions. Miles has a question, I think. I mean, I know there were interactions between working group two and working group three. Um, Lisa can perhaps more to it, but certainly not. Not broadly, perhaps at the higher level, it, but certainly not. That is the first time I've heard of that. I don't know if. You <laughs> I can't hear the question, so I have no idea. I'm sure it was really brilliant, though. <laughs> I'm very sorry, everyone. That was my fault. Um, Miles, do you mind relaying the question? <laughs> sorry, Lisa. It was my bad. Um, it was uh, in the Working Group 3 report, for the first time in since the 90s, there was a statement that the cost of um, limiting warming to 2 degrees would be less than the benefits of limiting warming to two degrees. So it was, they, they, they made a, in, in the summary, they made a, a, a statement of cost, cost benefit comparison. And I, I was just intrigued to know, as soon as I saw that, how was working group two involved in that? Because this is working group three opining about the value of limiting warming to two degrees, which is kind of a big thing. Um. Well, <laughs> how to, to, uh, the interactions between the working groups have over time become much better and we were much more engaged with each other this time than in previous, at least the, the two reports that I've been involved in before. Having said that though, that statement, as far as I know, that was not something that we were necessarily involved in. But I just wanted to point out that I think from the, the perspective of funding for adaptation and financing for adaptation specifically, the numbers are all over the place and we have made an effort to try to organize them and to try to figure out sort of what is the best um, assessment of the cost of adaptation but ultimately the conclusion is that it is too difficult to say. Um, one of the things that was we were able to say is that the the 100 billion that was promised uh, for adaptation is not unlikely to be sufficient um, but so just as a relation to the kind of the costing processes, I think challenge with adaptation is, of course, we're really hard to assess progress and to know exactly when we're doing the right thing. Um, and I think that that has implications. Somebody had put in the chat or in one of the, the questions in the Q&A about sort of why isn't there more, fun, more effort for adaptation? I think part of it is that we're not, governments are hesitant to invest lots of money in adaptation because it's really hard to see exactly where the money is going. Um, so anyway, that gives a partial answer, but 
uh, yeah, I, I can't, I'm not sure exactly if there were people involved. I doubt it though. Okay, let's take uh, one, um, one question up here and then we go maybe to the online ones again. I should also say to the people who think about leaving, there is a reception afterwards, so it's worth it sticking around. I'm John Hoffmeyer. I'm with the Center for Mutual and Co-Owned Business here on campus. Uh, so I, I come at things from a finance perspective, uh, but I'm very sympathetic uh, to the notion that human behavior has to change and that we have to do uh, everything we can through the means that you've discussed. Uh, that said, I'm very concerned that the, the number that I believe that's needed to really deal with these issues, both from a human behavior perspective and from a technological perspective, is probably close to 30 trillion US dollars. Uh, there used to be 500 trillion uh, dollars in the world. And over the last five weeks, we've seen probably 50 trillion of that disappear as stock markets and bond markets and real estate markets have changed. So as I, as I look at this situation, it seems to me that we're gonna need both technological and human behavior changes. And you guys are all great storytellers. A lot of the technologically oriented people are not good storytellers. So my question is, won't you say more about what you think about some of these technological issues? Because people like me don't know. I don't trust that the venture capitalists who stand behind the carbon sequestration um, solutions are going to give us straight answers. And the people who are in the scientific community who are supposed to address the first question that you just asked can't answer honestly, because if the, the sulfur goes up into the air, we don't see a blue sky. And that's so discouraging to all of us that scientists can't talk about that particular solution in any kind of honest way. So my question is, will you actually be better storytellers about some of the technological answers, because you do know more about it than we do. And if you are willing to, will you just tell us a little bit more about what you really think the answers are? Who would like to go first on this? I can, I can start and say, you can say, give a, techno, a technological opinion, but I think a scientist, I mean, recognize technology certainly has a role but I think for the most part, we need to be more informed about some of the technological options. And it's all very well to say, like, I'm an ecosystems person and I'm aware of the technolo technological options, but truly, like, I need to be more informed about them. And I feel like there is also a bit of a disconnect and sort of there's a tendency in all of these scientific discourse to have everyone has their silos. And I think that is quite a significant silo is this technological also quite speaking quite bluntly, the technological solutions seem like a good solution, but are viewed with suspicion and it's a bit dramatic and things can happen. Who take, who's in charge of the technology at what scale are we applying these things? Um, so I think there needs to be more discourse and learning between the two. Yeah. Okay, I can see you're looking at me, so I guess that means I should say something, but um, I mean, so first of all, I want to highlight, I'm a social scientist and I do not understand these technologies particularly well either. However, I think what's really critical to, to um, there, there, one, one important conclusion that, that is in the poverty chapter, chapter eight of the working group two report underscores that uh, technology transfer, for instance, technology is can be another way to divide people and increase inequalities. And that's because only certain people might have access to them and benefit from them. And as we know by all of <laughs> almost every single strategy, there tend to be externalities and there will be some somebody somewhere who's going to lose on it. It, it might be the ecosystems, it might be the people, um, it might be the village next door or down the road or whatever. But I, I also think that it's not, I mean, again, I just want to underscore, I, I really think that, you know, if, if you think that technology can address things like racism, then maybe there is something there. But I honestly think that, you know, these are the core issues that are at the heart here. Why is there, I mean, as, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu talked about, adaptation apartheid, why are some countries getting more funding for adaptation than others? It, it, there, is, there is not just about kind of, a, it's not just a technical problem or solution. There are much more fundamental issues about kind of, 
human uh, philosophy about uh, human human kind of understanding of the world and the, the dominance of certain development paradigms over others and the kind of trampling on others. So, I mean, I think it's, I, I, obviously, I, if I were there, we would have a longer discussion later, but I think that there's a bigger, um, a kind of bigger issue. I see technology as only one slice of the solution. This issue comes back in the online questions here as well. For example, Amber uh, asked, do you see indigenous knowledge and methods for sustain uh, sustainability being incorporated in adaptation uh, and recognition of adaptation limits? If so, how? Uh, Mia uh, sa says, there has been a growing debate on how rewilding can be introduced as a contemporary nature-based climate solution. Do you think it has the scope to be implemented on a global scale when the definition of rewilding is so broad and complex, could this be a new way to integrate biodiversity restoration um, and climate action? Um, maybe you can briefly uh, react to those. And um, maybe one additional thing that seems to pop up as well is this kind of dichotomy between trying to bring up no local knowledge whilst operating in sort of the global economic system that was brought up also by, by this question. I wonder, um, it might be also helpful to talk about what, uh, what are the forces that sort of bringing up local knowledge and integrating that at the level that it at least is on par with technological solutions. What are the actors that, uh, that are placed against this? Um, how, how are those narratives shaped that don't allow this to come up? Because from what came, what came out from your contributions was that there is really a mismatch in terms of what is being done at the local level and what some policymakers discuss somewhere. And um, something that sort of uh, goes through my mind is, uh, if, uh, might there be also a gender aspect, right? I mean, very often those uh, technical solutions, engineer solutions are championed by men, uh, very often more local indigenous um, knowledge solutions are championed by women. Is there also a gender power uh, imbalance that might need to be discussed there? Um, maybe first, uh, first reactions to, uh, again, nature-based solutions uh, and uh, indigenous knowledge and maybe this uh, conflict of how do we get more of that maybe into mainstream discussion? There's, I mean, there's fantastic opportunities that we can learn and in terms of indigenous knowledge or any particular nature-based solution. But again, it becomes the scale mismatch that, and like we can talk about all the complexities and I can give you the most nuanced answer. But at the end of the day, we have su we summarized this whole report at a global scale and we have to give a few lines of information to people. So there is this tendency to take a potential solution, scale it up and say it works really well, where you lose all of the local nuance. I'll, I'll use rewilding as an example. Rewilding can be as a, can be a fantastic opportunity for people to connect with nature. You can have increased the adaptive adapt, adapt, adapt capacity of the land. You can potentially get increased carbon mitigation. You increase the biodiversity. You restore ecosystem processes. You can have potential climate feedbacks. All all great. But also, if you look at this at some of the scales, like some people don't want rewilding. And if you say, okay, rewilding's worked beautifully, we've done this lovely rewilding project, and we're gonna do it in Oxford, and everyone's very happy, and all the tourists come and look at the buffalo, or whatever's hanging around Oxford. Um, and then you go to a place in Africa, and you say, okay, now we're going to rewild this area, and we're gonna put some elephants, and we're gonna put some lions, and this is great, this has worked so well. And the local community are like, we don't want elephants, because they're gonna come raid our crops, and they're gonna stand on us. So, so please keep this to yourselves. So again, it's the scale mismatch that we are talking of a global problem, we're seeking global solutions. And it's very difficult to scale this down to the local level. Um, well, you know, we make these recommendations, but what, how does it impact people locally? And again, it does become a, a local problem and a local solution. I don't know how you address the scale mismatch, but it is a fundamental problem when we're talking about this topic is that we are always talking at the global scale. And then we, we throw some nice language and we talk about indigenous communities, indigenous rights and local, local knowledge and local, what's people doing at the local scale, but that seldom translates, the, that story seldom translates all the way down. So I think, that, I think that some of the answer lies with, you know, sort of broad widespread education and empowerment of people to take these things into their own hands and feed it up the scale. 
briefly for me, I think one of the one of the drivers of all this is globalization and, and as and, and global thinking, thinking on the global scale. And I think one of the things that's very striking about the way that I guess capitalism to use the planet is that it's it's very comfortable with sacrifice zones. It's sort of okay if one bit of the planet suffers so that other people can be enriched. And this at this point, the entire planet is a kind of acceptable sacrifice zone. It's not really clear that anywhere in particular is being protected, um, and nor should perhaps any particular place be protected um, if it comes at the cost of everywhere else. And I think that that a lot of the a lot of the ways of thinking that are causing this are possibly thinking in planetary terms. So it may be that what we need to be tackling is 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 this sort of the drivers in, in thinking in, in in global terms away from the local. So it's possible that the, I, I, I'm not hugely enthusiastic about the concept of solutions, but that dealing with it has to, it has to be kind of on multiple local, local regional levels um, as, as sort of works in the, because especially if we're thinking in humanities terms, the way that people think and the stories they tell are different from community to community and what has traction you know, even in one part of one town might not have traction in another part of that town. I mean, it's got to, if people are going to really buy in, it's, it's if everyone's going to, or most people are going to, or enough people are going to, it's got to be <coughs> happening locally. Um, the, I mean, there are kind of concerns about um, you know, kind of global finance, global flows of goods, uh, you know, if we're, if we're kind of up against it in all sorts of ways, going to be needing to share resources globally, but I, it's, I wonder whether some of these mismatches are actually the problem um, and thinking about it in slightly different ways is, is going to be crucial for addressing it. Yeah, I mean, I just add to that that I mean, knowledge different context and I think very different than thinking as a local actor. So with indigenous or local knowledge, often it's very integrally attached to place. It's not something that can necessarily be translated or used, especially for things like financial instruments. So if you're a global actor, what is legible to you is, you know, standardized metrics and quantification and science in, in a sense and, you know, targets and we're going to, you know, the, the much celebrated announcement by over 100 countries that we're going to stop deforestation by 2030 and halt all land degradation. I'm not sure that they talk to, you know, farmers, for example, who might be considered degrading the land as a means of supporting their own local livelihoods. I think it's it's a sort of global thinking and target setting and quantification, which is understandable because if you're looking at the problem in a global scale, how else do you try to manage this complexity and understand it? But it creates this sort of contradiction. And then I think this is a real matter of, of just balancing power across scales because for local knowledge, it's best probably operates best in local place. So you need to have local people need to have enough power in the decision making process and be included enough to integrate their knowledge. It's not so much a matter of necessarily any of us you know, then thinking that we're going to think like an indigenous person or, or what, you know, or what, or a particular local community. So I, I do think, yes, yeah, scale is a, a huge issue and a huge challenge. And it's kind of a paradox. It's something that I've sort of struggled with my whole, my whole career. Like, is there any way to sort of resolve this fundamental conflict between what makes something legible and, and sort of governable at the global scale versus what you need at the local level to be able to act and adapt and be resilient? I think that also highlights a little bit sort of the communications, uh, communication across scales and where where problems might occur, right? I mean, we, we heard earlier that uh, the IPCC report itself has heavy government involvement in, in the peer review, for example, uh, and it is it needs to be agreed by governments, uh, uh, yet uh, exactly that communication route uh, also stands in the way of, uh, of I guess, uh, achieving progress. Um, okay, we, uh, let's take one more question, and I think we are, we are almost running out of time, but maybe we take the, this last one, please. I think we can... Uh, the... Hello, just a quick one. Um, I just really found your... I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, the lady in the middle, but I found it really fascinating hearing about kind of the role of um, anthropology within this. I'm just wondering, is, is there involvement for psychology around kind of collective trauma and how this kind of this the trauma, trauma we're all experiencing in a big global scale and how that might be affecting the way we're reacting and the way why we're not reacting and how we're digesting kind of the, what we're going through. 
I would think absolutely. And, um, and I think that it's, I, I, mean, I didn't mention psychology, I probably should have done um, a lot of uh, kind of trying to understand how people think and, and reflecting on what this is doing and, and the kind of paralysis and the reasons for it. Um, there's, there's obviously power and political dimensions to this, which I've focused on myself, but there are also, um, I suppose, kind of mourning and fear and, and all sorts of other elements of this that, that um, I suppose have to be talked about more frankly in particular ways. Um, and a, a kind of accessible emotional repertoire needs to be on offer away from kind of just rationality or or, or, or some of the, the, the language that is used um, to talk about these things more formally. Um, I, I saw Lisa nodding vigorously, I don't know whether you want to comment on this. Uh, I just wanted to say that the so this the working group two report for the first time also looks at um, in the context of health impacts also the impacts on mental health. So actually, it's what you're describing is exactly that we're seeing a huge amount of new research done looking at what is climate change doing uh, to people, trauma, anxiety, and so on. And it's so much, in fact, that it's it's part of the the, the work that's been assessed. So. Uh, you can look in chapter seven <laughs> on that um, and you'll find some more on that. But it's obviously a huge, huge uh, growing field also in terms of what are the, the psychological barriers for inaction? Uh, why, why is this simply the case that we're not, we're not acting? Um, and if I could just comment quickly, because I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot recently, is I've mentioned this window of opportunity that's closing. And I think it's understandable that we might consider that to be, you know, related to greenhouse gas emission reduction and also the opportunities for adaptation. But actually, I also think that one of the windows of opportunity, and this is, of course, I'm just saying this of my own opinion and from, from my experiences now, but I think one of the windows of opportunity that's closing is the fact that we're starting to become, um, to normalize human suffering to the point where we are no longer really seem not, sort of that seems to be one of the drivers of inaction. And I think that's part of this sort of um, other issue around the psychology of, of that climate change is bringing. So that's just sort of an observation. And, and can I just take advantage of this moment? Because I want to mention that there is a really exciting event on Thursday that's going to be online that UCL is running that's looking at whether we need the IPCC. So if anybody's interested in that part of it, um, that, that event, uh, I guess you can email me or um, yeah, find me online and um, I'll let you know more about that event. <laughs> closing point uh, i want to highlight one more time that next week will also be a discussion uh with uh, uh the working group three authors of the ipcc so that's on mitigation uh both uh, from uh, oxford academics and outside of oxford academics so if you're interested in that please come uh, trinity college 12 30 starting at one yes okay perfect um, please stick around. Uh, there is reception. Uh, I guess one uh, thing that came up in all the uh, in all the presentations discussion is the need to listen, to discuss, to stay open for all kinds of knowledge from individuals. So please uh, be merry and um, have a good talk. Thank you very much.